volunteer opportunity uh, uh, last summer, and it's been really great to get to know more of Ramsey <coughs> County from the park park side. Um, I love biking, and I love Battle Creek Park, which is where I live nearby. And I also care a lot about the same things that you all care about. So when I announced that I'm going to be attending this forum, they asked if I could introduce the speaker. I'm happy to do so. Sharam Masagi, he has a PhD in limnology, works for the University of Minnesota Extension Service. He develops research-based water resources education and training for water resources professionals and communities. Programs focus on innovative land and in-lake practices that reduce the environmental impacts of excesses, excessive stormwater runoff. Recent research has included lake water quality monitoring and investigating the potential impacts of climate change on our local water resources. Please help me welcome. Again, thank you so much. Uh, thanks uh, to Anne for uh, having us, having me here. I'm really excited to be here and I'm so happy to have a chance to talk to you about algae. Of course, it's a topic that I get really excited about and I think it's, it's, it's one of the things we need to pay more attention to, so thank you very much. Again, my name is Shahram Misagi. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension Water Resources Team. Just a quick check, can everybody hear me okay? And, um, okay, good, good. I can, I can, all right, good. So we'll start with this, um, uh, with this presentation. You can tell I'm always used to standing on this side. It's terrible, you know, get into a habit, you know, you get, it's crashing. okay. So what we're gonna talk about is the harmful algal bloom and what they are and you know, why, we get, why we need to get excited about it. Again, thank you, uh, but I just wanna start with acknowledgement because it's really a, a topic that has taken a lot of people's work and cooperation and collaboration to bring this uh, topic at the university and throughout the state. So I wanna thank the state agency, MPCA, Minnesota Department of Health, uh, many of the ed our educators, researchers from different colleges, from Mankato and different places, uh, also educators at the University of Minnesota Extension, homeowners, and local government agencies just like yours that really bring the people together. And of course, it's your interest that makes the whole thing run, right? If you're here because you obviously care about water quality, you care about clean water, and that's what really kind of um, drives our, our efforts. So thank you for that. Um, oh, just one quick note on the, uh, we also have been putting together a web page, uh, Harmful Hab, uh, at the University of Minnesota. So we try to put much of the information that I share with you tonight, uh, that we'll have it available at the website as well. So it's a good place to go to for resources. Okay, so you already see this is what we're talking about, algae, and what we obviously don't want it are having to do with signs like this that says war, warning the water is polluted or it's not safe to touch or drink. So that's what we're here. We say, how can we get away from having to use a sign like that? And we want to we want to know what are some of the things we can get involved with. Uh, what we'll talk about tonight, of course, is harm for algal bloom research. But I couldn't not to share with you a little bit about other things. It's always kind of interesting. So maybe we'll talk, uh, take a quick look at algae. What's algae? I never know if I should say what is algae or what are algae and what is algal, right? So it's what is algal and what are algae? I gotta keep reminding myself that. And then why do we care? You know, what is the urgency? Is there a problem? Are we, you know, are we looking for a problem or is there really a problem that we need to get worried about? And I'll share a little bit about the research. What are some of the neat things that are happening? Good? All right. So to, uh, taking a look at the algae, what is the algae? Well, the first thing to do, go to, into a lake and ask the question, who is eating who, right? It's a, you're looking at the biologist system, somebody always has to eat somebody, and it's good to look at that in a lake. And we can see you got the you know, fish eating fish on the top, you know, those are the ones we try to chase and fish, and they have to have to eat the fish that eat the zooplankton, the, the little animals or critters that run around the lake or a stream, they eat the algae, and of course, these fish eat the zooplankton, and the zooplankton eat the algae, right? And that's how the system works. What's interesting, we don't see algae eating anything else. So it's actually algae using the nutrients to make the food, and that's the case because they're photosynthesis, right? They, they, they photosynthesize their food, so they make their own food, right? 
So that's really important, just like a landscape, upland landscape, where we have the plants, we rely on the plants to provide the energy, to provide the food for the system, algae do the same in the aquatic system. So algae are the primary producers, and they are really important to uh, any aquatic system, whether it be a wetland or a stream or lake, they are the primary producers, so we rely, our system relies on them to support it. But what's really cool to keep in mind is that algae is not a type of a plant or a type of animals. Algae, when we talk about algae, they're, we're really talking about a group of organisms. And actually, anything that can do photosynthesis and sort of lives in water, at least for our talk tonight. So algae, is, it does not represent one kingdom or one species or one genus, it's just anything. It could be anything that, as long as they produce photosynthesis, they're in, they're called algae. And then we like them. But what happens when you're dealing with such a wide uh, audience, you know, of course, then algae ends up to do what? To be of any shape or any form. They end up to have just a huge diversity in the algae, in the group algae. So they can be any shape or any form, which makes it really cool to work with them. You get a, for instance, you get a drop of from the lake, you put it under the microscope, and you may find all different sorts of good looking algae there. And what also that does is that some algae could live in the sediment all the time, or they could live in the sediment maybe just during the winter. Maybe they just winter in the sediment, but then they come up in the spring and they float around in the water, so they can have different life cycle. Some of them, if you have any docks in, in, by this, in, on a lake or on your boat, you can see algae can grow on rocks or, or they can attach themselves. So they can be doing that, or they can just sometimes attach to the rock, sometimes live in the water. They get all sorts of form, and of course they can be suspended in water, kind of float around, so we call them plankton or phytoplankton, kind of floating stuff. So these are the ones that we're mostly talking about tonight, the freshwater phytoplanktons or algae that are free floating in the lake. So this so. So what's interesting is that, you know, they come in all forms and shapes. And the point is algae, oh, I see you kept the slides original. Thanks, <laughs> you're a good man. <laughs> I, um, so the point is that algae are good, you know, right? Algae are primary producers, the supporter system. They do good for <laughs> us and, they, and also they call them the architects of Earth's atmosphere. They're three and a half billion years. I can't fathom how old is a billion, but they're that old. The point is they've been around for a long time. They actually help to transform our atmosphere into something that we can breathe. So they have a lot of lessons in their DNAs. And of course, they're photosynthesis, and they form our aquatic systems. And again, they come in all sorts of shapes. You, they can have flagellates, so they can swim around, or they can be like crystals, like diatoms, and they're just beautiful. If you have spare time, just look for diatom on Google and images. It's just amazing, you know. I'm, I'm serious. I know you'll find it as exciting as we do. So to go ahead and check it out. And or you can the ones we can find them on our lakes. Um, this is a picture of muskrat or cara, which is an algae. It's a microalgae. So it's so they can be strands or they can be filamentous type of algae, right? And we can get all, or in this one we have. We, I'm sorry, you may not be able to see this, but if you imagine you've been to a lake, you see this kind of a floaty, cloudy things floating right on the water and sometimes beneath the water. And this particular one is the uh, Limbia. Uh, Limbia has the, um, the hint of a sewer system or sewer smell also. And they fall, they turn brownish and you get the call, who let the sewage out on the lake? You go out there, it's Limbia because it just has that sort of look and smell. But that's the type of algae that form a little bit thick mat. Or you can have algae that kind of really looks like dissolving the water from top of the bottom. It just looks very soupy, very green. And there are a couple of species that do that. Microcystis is this one. You know, you, you put your hands in it after like two inches, you don't see nothing anymore. You know, it's just gone. It's just cloudy and green. And that's the microcystis. So this is a, uh, um, and Abina, I believe this one is, you know, you can see like somebody had put paint in water. It looks very uh, bright green. So these are, so these are the different form of algae that you're going to see uh, if you went to a lake. So what's the problem? Why do we get all hyper about it? What's the problem? Well, the issue is they tend to grow, right? They grow and they can grow pretty widely and excessively. So this is a picture of a lake. 
So you can see what has turned into, it's just a massive algae growth on here. So when it grows that much, you can't swim, you can't recreate, you cannot fish. So it, you lose all that value of a lake. And of course, if it's too much, it's gonna impact the wildlife as well. That is the problem. So the catch is this, yes, they're great, they're primary producers, but somehow something happens and they have excessive growth and they grow way too much. And we, that is when the problem is, they can grow too much. So what happens if they grow too much? Well, we said algae is here, you know, everybody eats everybody down here. Algae is the primary producer, supports the whole system. But if they grow too much, let's say we have our, what do we call this, nice lake. We have our nice lake here. Everything is good, you know, we have few algaes because we do want them, right? Because they're photosynthesis, they produce food, but something somehow happens. Well, we know, for instance, temperature helps. We know nutrient helps that all of a sudden they decide to grow more, right? Just adding fertilizer, we add f nutrient to the water, things are gonna grow. But we, there is something else, we know some physical, chemical, biological conditions change, and all of a sudden they grow very excessively. So when they grow too much, we say they have a bloom, or we have an algal bloom. So we have a bloom when there is just excessive growth, but what happens when you have this much algae, end of the life, end of the season, what happens to all the algae that are alive here and they die off? They can either sink to the bottom, right? And what happens if they all sink to the bottom? They're gonna start decompose, and what do they use as they decompose? My fish is giving you a hint. Oxygen. So they're going to use all the oxygen, so there's no oxygen left for the fish. So that's how you get, end up getting fish kill or stressed fish in here, because all that material goes to the bottom, de decomposes, uses the oxygen. Or if we have too much algae or, or a bloom, if that doesn't, that may happen too, but the other thing is, some of this algae can actually start producing toxins. Toxins are the things that are poisonous to us. And, the and this one, when they produce toxin, then we call them harmful algal bloom or HAPS. So that's the problem. We like algae, they're good for the system, but somehow down the road something happens and they grow excessively. They grow too much, they form bloom, the bloom either die off in the bottom, deplete the oxygen, or they can produce what? They can produce toxin and become harmful algal bloom. So that's what we get concerned. So okay, so what do we do now? So what, what is the issue? issue is I like need to learn how to use this. All right, here we go. So, so again, this is the actual picture of a sample of algae. They can't really get that thick. So you ask the question, well, wow, what is the, this gradient? What do we start, you know? Well, this you can imagine if this is like a clear lake, right? There's no clear, clear lake, but I mean, there's a water that doesn't have much algae. This is what would be the other extreme maybe. And in the middle, of, in, in this process, we have clear water, then we can have a little bit of algae here and about uh, 10,000, if I took a milliliter of a water and put it in a microscope and I counted all the algae, I would have about 10,000 algae right about here. You know, it could be seven, I mean numbers are suggested. Something around here that you start seeing in this water, you can see the algae, say, oh okay, I have algae in the water. Then, oh sorry about that. And then when you, the population gets about 100,000, 100,000 cells, at, at least in the case of microcystis, in this case at least, all the algaes are different, different size, but in this case of a microcystis, you would, say, you would say, okay, this is getting to a nuisance. At that level, you just can't swim in it, you're putting your hands in it, you know, bring your hands up, you can see stuff on your hand, it just, you know, who wants to swim in that water, the fish get more stressed, but when it reaches about a million cells per milliliter, that's when you have a chance of having what produces toxin. And, I have, and that's what we call harmful algal bloom. But to make things more interesting and exciting is that they don't necessarily have to have that much. They can be a harmful algal bloom when we have very little, that's why the color blue, or you can have a little bit, too much, or many, many of them. At, at any level, they can produce the toxin. But generally it happens when you have lots of them when you have a bloom, it kind of happens after the bloom. So, okay, so we talked about, I told you about algae, they're good, that they cause problem, and some of them are harmful algal bloom. It's an easy way, is there an easy way to tell if I have algae in my lake, if it's a harmful or not? Actually there is, thanks to PCA, they have put this on their uh, web uh, website, you can, that's the number of the publication. So the, 
the idea is you go to a lake, you know, you say, oh, is it, what is this? What kind of algae do I have here? It's pretty green, it's soupy. You take a jar, you fill it up with the water samples. Of course, you close it, maybe put it in a Ziploc bag so it doesn't contaminate anything. Put it in the refrigerator, let it sit overnight, come back the next day. You open the refrigerator, take it out without disturbing it, put it on the counter, and you see, okay, what happened to all the algae? If most of the algae is settled on the bottom, they say, oh, okay. Or is it most of it is gonna float to the top? If it all settles to the bottom, then you say, okay, it's algae, but it's not a harmful algal bloom, most likely. And everything, if most of it float to the top, because one of the characteristics of harmful algal bloom, at least the ones we have in Minnesota, is the blue, they're blue-green or cyanobacteria, they're blue-green algae, and they have the ability to regulate their buoyancy. So they can go from up to the bottom. If they want more sunlight, they go to the top. If they want more nutrients, cooler water, they go to the bottom. So then we can tell, oh, this is a simple test to say if you're dealing with a harmful algal bloom or algae. It's pretty cool. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about HABs. One of the ones that I said we deal with generally mostly here in uh, Minnesota, in this area at least, is microcystis. This is what it looks if you went to a lake that's infested by it. That's how it would look if you put it in a jar. This is what it looks like a colony under just a uh, microscope. And these are more, uh, more magnified picture of the cells and individual colonies. It's a pretty cool um, uh, species actually. And they grow, and they grow. What's interesting, I'm going sidebar, I'm killing my time here. But what's interesting, they grow like crazy out in the lake, right? No one can figure out how to make them grow in the laboratory. You bring them in the lab and they go singular. They don't keep their colony. I don't know how do they know you've moved them in the lab, but they bring them in the lab and then they <laughs> stop being in the colony. So any of you guys are interested, you will get a big prize if you can manage how to grow them in the lab and keep their colony. Um, but they're pretty, they're pretty potent stuff. Uh, imagine this is the level of how toxic something could be. Let's say ethylene glycol, I think that's antifreeze. If I could take two TA tablespoons, I would just say, yuck, I'll never have that again. It won't kill me, you know, it's not that toxic really if I just have two tablespoons or one tablespoon, about two grams. DDT is right here. If I have a, just a tiny amounts of it, it will get me sick. And the dioxin, if it's just get the trace of it, it will probably hurt me and damage me pretty bad. Microcystin is a toxin that's produced by microcystis. Look at where it falls. It doesn't take that much to be harmful. These toxins are very potent. Okay, so that's another reason we're concerned because if they come into the play, it doesn't take that much to uh, cause damage. But fortunately, not all the blooms are harmful algal bloom. As we say, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So we don't know exactly. That's one of the area we're trying to find out. Now, the drinking water health advisory, of course. Remember, we gave you those numbers from 10,000 to a million. If we don't see anything and we don't detect anything in the drinking water from the tap, we're cool. But if you get some, then we want people at risk not to drink it. And if it's detectable enough that you can measure it, then you don't want to drink that at all. Now, this I'm not giving you numbers because the standards are kind of dynamic at the moment. Some states have them, EPA has them, uh, but, but these are happening more and more. So we say, okay, let's test it um, and see what if they're in the drinking water or not. Okay, why does it matter? I told you, I told you their problem, how they cause the problem. Well, and I said one of the factors that impacts them is temperature. So we know the climate is changing. We know winters are getting warmer. Uh, we know things that summers are getting warmer. So with that, we know that we're gonna, we're gonna have more encouragement for the halves to happen, which actually, I don't know if we're detecting them better or, if, or for real, they're happening more often. So we are seeing them happen more often in Minnesota. And the other thing is 20% of the Minnesotans rely on surface water for drinking as a source of drinking water. So we have, uh, so this is another risk. It's we don't want to get any of those haps in this drinking water because it becomes extremely difficult and expensive to get them out. Good, this is for me to pause. So just making sure we're doing okay. Any questions so far? I still got another 60 minutes? No. <laughs> Okay, are we good? You hear me okay? Okay. So now we're gonna shift a little bit, we're gonna go into research. So we 
told you what algae, you know, we showed what algae are, uh, what, how they may cause problem, they're urgent, um, so, so what? What are we studying? What's, what's, the, what's the cool stuff or what's, the, what's the exciting about it? Again, I wanna go back to our webpage because so many people have worked so hard to collaborate together to bring all the information together and really the more folks we have to use the web page, the better it will get. Uh, there would be more pressure on me to get it uh, updated and everything. So <laughs> please use it, please use it and let us know how it is because we want it to be a place for folks to go and get information from it. So it's just HAP, if you remember <coughs> umn.edu, it's just HAP, harmful algal bloom, uh, dot umn dot edu. Okay. So research area, sorry, I'm breaking all the rules about slides, too busy, too many words, but um, research areas. Remember this I showed before, right? We said if this, we have a natural lake, we have a normal conditions, we just have a little bit of algae, something happens, right? Well, we know nutrient and temperature helps it, but there are other things that something triggers the algae to grow rapidly and excessively and cause a bloom. So of course, would you want to know what those things are? Exactly, so there's a lot of focus here. So that's much, much research is going into the tracking, monitoring, and, and, and detection of what, what is causing these guys bloom. And once they have the bloom, of course, they can cause um, fish stress or they can produce toxin. And just a quick definition here. So when they're growing everywhere, we call it bloom. When they come to the top, we call them scums, right? Very technical term. But it is, it is what you will find in every book. But my point is the scum doesn't mean they are growing now. It just means they grew, they, were, they had a bloom. So scum is, is a representative of a bloom, but it's not the bloom, just the better. So, that, so they can form harmful algal, um, they can form to toxins as well. What's happening, I can share with you the uh, Science Museum of Minnesota. We're very lucky in Minnesota. We have a rich history of people who have dedicated a lot of time and effort in researching about harmful algal bloom. These folks are from the Science Museum of Minnesota and they are focusing on tracking harmful algal bloom across Minnesota. Where, is the, where are these halves in Minnesota? How long have they been in Minnesota? Which lake there are more, which lake there are less? That's what they're focusing on. So what do they do? They go to num they do many things, but one of the things they do, they go to some of the lakes, they take a water sample, right? So you, can you see it's greenish? You know, it's almost getting to a nuisance level, I think, you know, but it's, it's not there yet. So they get the samples. If you can see this, there's a little jar that's got a little filter, like a coffee filter there. They pour the water over it, so to call, that filter traps all the stuff that in it. So they can either use that to count what kind of algae it's in there or what type of algae is in there and they make known, then they make an inventory. Okay, that's, that lake had this much algae, harmful algal bloom or not. But one thing they're really good at and they're sort of nationally known is actually they go do sediment cores and they, they want to understand what happened 100 years ago. What kind of algae was there? Because if we can figure out what was there before, what is today, what is here today, that gives us a sense of being able to forecast what could be coming next. So that's really important, that's some of the work that the Science Museum of Minnesota is doing. The other part is, um, again, we said we're really interested to understand what's happening here. So if you're familiar with the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, that's a branch of University of Minnesota department, and oh, let me show up. So we, we, created, we developed this buoy here and the PhD student that was working on it called the David buoy. So they, see, so they put the buoy on the lake and you can see it's got all the instruments that measures all the meteorological data, the uh, solar radiation, temperature, humidity, also has instruments that measures everything from bottom to top, dissolve oxygen, temperature. So we get all that information, then we look at the algae population to see if we can see a trend. Was there one of these parameters that caused the algae to bloom? Then we can try to understand, okay, what's happening? What is causing the algae growth? Again, more information we want to understand, what, okay, what else is causing this massive growth? Again, the point is, if we can understand what is happening, what the process is, then once we know the process, we can ask what if questions. What if I lower the temperature? What if I mix the water? That would help me as a manager to forecast for the future and better be ready for these haps that are gonna happen more often. And that's what the focus is. So one of the things, this is the USGS group. 
uh, Eric and Richard are working on. Again, they go to different lakes. For instance, Lake St. Croix and um, Madison Lake in Southwest Minnesota. And they take the samples. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to use a computer model. So these dots are where they took the sample. This is time. This is how much algae they found. So they can see through different times. So these dots are when they found the algae, the how much uh, biomass they had. And the line is what the computer estimated. That's pretty good, right? So the computer, they say, okay, they developed this computer model or they're working, they're applying a computer model that can predict how much algae is there or, and is doing a good job. So that information we can use again to forecast in the future. So that forecast can keep going because as a manager, that's what you want to ask the question. What if I did this? What if I spend the money to do this BMP? Is that going to make an impact? Okay, just um, very quickly, this is again, uh, this is microcystis. We've seen this before. And uh, the picture, that's, that's the one that I'm going to show, share with you. So one of the research that we did at San Antonio Falls Laboratory, the question was, what happens to these guys? Where do they, why do they have a bloom and where do they grow? So we know how it works, right, a little bit. If, imagine this is my lake, this is top of the lake, this is bottom of the lake. We think when we have a bloom, they grow uniformly throughout the whole water column from top to bottom. And especially if you have a wind that's about a good wind, which is faster than three meters per second, mixes everything. But what if the wind drops and there's no wind, then we say, oh, everything flows to the top and forms the scums, and they can form a toxin or die off, throb up the oxygen. So we know this the process, but the question was, do they really grow everywhere in the water? Or is there somewhere in the water depth they like more? Is there some mixing of water that they like more than the other places? And that's what we did. So we used this tower, there's two columns in it, and obviously it's called plankton tower. Um, so this one, the water is mixed. This one is the water is not mixed. So we put the algae in both sides, we grew it, then we use laser to measure where the algae is or get an indication where the algae is. Where do they clump most? Because on top of here, I'm mixing the water. So I'm asking the question, is there somewhere that they like the mixing more than the other places? And it turns out there is. They like a little bit of mixing. So it's not total calm water they like. They actually like it if the water is mixing. And two other researchers, Anne and Jackie, have really worked uh, hard on this part. And they have shown, again, if this is time, and this is the depth of the water, and the red is, I have lots of algae, blue, I have no algae. You, they, what they showed is that also what encourages algae, or sort, sort of modulates the algae, algae population, is how well the water mixes from top to bottom. So okay, so now we're learning a little bit more things, indications of what drives the algae population. Again, why do we do that? Because if we can understand how they work, that's going to help us to do what? Forecast and predict what's going to happen in the future. And that's what we're after. Solutions, um, how am I doing on time? Okay. Let's go there. Um, so it's this, but the good thing is we have solutions, right? It's, I told you all the urgency, but there are also a lot of solutions. There's much to learn of what triggers them. There's much to learn why do they grow. There's much to learn. Why do they produce toxin? Um, just a one second diversion. And what's interesting with algae, these toxins, they produce in their cell, but they never release it. It's only released when they die off or somebody bites in it and they burst. So I asked the question, why would, some, why would someone, why would something produce a toxin, they hold it inside and they don't release it until they die off? You know, just like, so there are some questions that uh, for a lot of people are interested to find out. Okay, so what are some of the solutions? Sorry about that. So once we have the algae here, so there are two things we can do. We can treat the algae that's here. And there are different ways we can treat the algae. We can use copper sulfide. Have you used copper sulfide in your pond or lake? It actually kills all the bacteria, basically. So we can use copper sulfide to kill whatever is in there. And um, so it would get rid of the bacteria as well. Peroxide actually is some, it's a, you know, it's a rich oxygenated water, basically, H2O2, um, which actually people in Australia, folks in Australia and Europe use it on the lake level. They dump gallons and gallons, thousands into a lake, and that really seems to be um, controlling the algae very well. Pond dyes. 
I used to work for a city. Folks they used to call me and say, my daughter is getting married tomorrow. Come and clean the pond. So, okay. <laughs> How do we do that? Actually, it turns out people are smart. They figure out, you know what? If I go dump a green or a blue dye in the pond, what is it going to do? First of all, it's going to make it look blue, but also it's going to hold, it's going to shade, right? It's not going to allow the sunlight in and the algae will die off. So in the small ponds, you can put dye if you want to approach it that way. Or you can use herbicides. Some herbicides work on some of the algae as well. Alum. How many folks are familiar with the alum in water? Or alum with pickling? It's the same idea. You have a jar, you pour the alum, alum sulfate in it. It grabs all the nutrients or phosphorus, and it settles to the bottom, forms a flux. So now your water doesn't have a nutrient. So if I were algae, like there's no place to get the food, so algae would simply starve. Ultraviolet and other systems are happening. They are viable. The question is how practical they are, how expensive they are. Barley straw. Has anyone here used barley straw to manage it? So I have a pond, maybe up to two or three acres. I go around, I stake the uh, barley straw in the, uh, in the water, but they're just, just about floating. And somehow barley straws interrupt the cycle of the algae. Either they take the, over the carbon cycle or either they promote some sort of a bacteria. There are many theories. Google it and you'll have fun reading about it. Uh, but it's happening. We have a couple of local companies who've been doing this for many years. And barley straws can control algae. But of course, the big picture solution, we've always known about it. What's really nice about algae control is the, the, the stuff that we all know about already, right? To control algae starts upstream. We have a lake, we, we just can't have things come into the lake. It's the same solution we have in many of the conservation efforts. We just can't allow things to come into the lake. So wetland conservation, aquatic buffers, cover crops, Anything to keep that soil underground, it's definitely what the algae control can use for in the long term. That's what the ultimate is going to control it. So I hope that has given you a kind of a quick overview of algae, the issues with algae, why the problem, and that we also have solutions. And the fun part is the research is uh, to understand what, what makes them go, what, what sort of a hint do they get that all of a sudden they have the bloom, and when do they decide or how do they decide to produce toxins. So those are some of the um, questions. Uh, ultimately, I think we do all of these things, again, to be ready. Um, I, 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 in my opinion, I think it's too much at stake to ignore algae. I think when they come into a lake, they Im impact us economically, health-wise, and many different uh, uh, ways. So we need to be ready for them. And this I'm just going to show you. This is one of the models we, uh, we deal with. So this is the area of photo, right? This is South Central Lake, I think. Uh, South Center Lake in north of Twin Cities. So this is our lake. So I'm going to say, okay, so remember that chart I showed you, the blue is water, no algae, right? And red means that's lots of algae. So, so I, I'm going to, this is time starting, just believe me, this is time. Starts from the early season, goes to the end. And we're going to follow what happens to algae cover of the lake, okay? Are you ready for this? It took me a long time to put this slide together, so you got to be... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so here it is, so we go, and you can see we have a little bit of algae changes, the algae changes again more, you can see how it's changing, Some, and end of the season ends up like this. What did you notice most? Is it uniform? It's not uniform. You can have spots on a lake covered by all pretty good, decent water, but you can have spots on the lake that can be, have harmful algal bloom. So we call this maps, and what we hope to do is to produce what we call um, risk maps or exposure maps. So it can show me on many, on many lakes, I can go and say, look here, I can look at a seasonal exposure map, and that is going to help me. And, so, and you can see how it changes through the time. Then knowing the maps, it can help me to measure the associated health and uh, economical cost. I have more slides here. If we have time, we can share with you. But there is a much conversation that the aerosol, the algae that's in the air, actually just a paper came out from Florida today in the newspaper, that it can travel for a mile. So the, what are the uh, health associations? Let's say if I'm, my house is somewhere here and I look at the map and all the exposure is happening here, well, that has increased my risk of, of, of 
factor. And I want to know about it. So that's the next thing we're hoping to work with this. Uh, I know there was one question here. Yes. <coughs> On that map, does it make any difference as to the, uh, what's coming into the lake? In other words, is there uh, more toxins coming in where the is right now and less where the blue is? Absolutely. In this model, now you're getting me excited to talk about the model. It's actually a three-dimensional model, so we can actually follow the flow. So if that flow is bringing food, or is, uh, flow is bringing additional algae patches, we can ca account for it, theoretically. But life is always a little different. But so, so, that's what, so that's what we're hoping to do, again, is to prepare us, the local government, for what's going to happen uh, in the future. And ultimately, I think again, this is the view you want to have of a pond. Would you believe it? This is in the Twin Cities. This is a view from someone's backyard. I mean, how beautiful that is. And, and of course, that is something we don't want to have there. We don't want this warning signs. We just want those views. Uh, with that, uh, I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Thank you very much. And if there are questions now or later or I'm John Mansky with Ramsey County Public Works um, with the Environmental Services Department, and uh, I do the lake water quality monitoring for the county. Um, today I'll talk a little bit about our monitoring program in the summer and in the winter and what those two different operations look like. Um, go into a little bit about um, some of our EIS stuff that we do as well as uh, some chloride monitoring and um, what the overall lake water quality grades were for the lakes that we monitor in the county. Um, we have 30 lakes in the county that uh, we have a vested interest in and that we either own property on them or boat ramp on them or they're uh, a main lake of concern in the county. Um, we try and sample those eight times in the May to September range and I'm gonna call that the summer range and that's what we refer to those as. Um, where we take a depth profile and take a bunch of different samples to measure a bunch of different parameters back here in the lab. Uh, we're on a state certified lab here where um, we do all of this monitoring in-house. Um, while we're out on the lake, we do a bunch of stuff, including um, aquatic vegetation monitoring, um, AIS, uh, aquatic invasive species monitoring, and um, do our own harmful algal bloom assessment. Uh, that was a great introduction. I get to skip over all of the educational components for that stuff. This is great. Um, but our harmful algal bloom assessment I created seven or eight years ago with Steve Heistry, who was with the NPCA at the time. And he had a great paper about how it's very challenging to measure these because they're so dynamic because they move around so much. And where you might take a sample and find you have a very high concentration in one area, you'll find everywhere else in the lake you don't. So to have management practices based on single site samples in the lake can be challenging and sometimes overcautious. So his research found that if you hit these four parameters in these concentrations, uh, a pH over nine, uh, a secchi disc or a transparency in the water of less than a meter, uh, cyanobacteria or blue-green algae bloom uh, concentration of over 100,000 cells per mil, or in a chlorophyll A concentration of over 50, you have all four of those, you highly likely are going to have a harmful algal bloom in that body of water, and then you should post accordingly that the water is dangerous or poses a risk. Um, these are all really quick to measure um, the, and can be done in, in a short amount of time. So if we see um, those first two parameters hitting when we're out in the field, we'll do the extra sampling to um, tell us if we're at risk or not. And if we find one that is impaired for that, we post and put out the news to anyone who can get the news out to you guys to you know, stay away and to stay out. Um, chlorophyll A concentration is a um, photosynthetic pigment in algae and other plants, and we use that as uh, an indicator of how, um, how many cells we have in a, in a sample. Um, this is a short list of some of the other parameters we do in the lab. Um, we're looking at phytoplankton and zooplankton communities on those lakes as well to look at how those fluctuate throughout the year. Um, we're also uh, doing E. coli tests on our beaches to make sure that we have a safe and swimmable beach area on all of our county beaches. Um, as well as some eDNA stuff that we've been doing the last couple of years to try and assess um, the abundance or um, presence or absence of um, some nuisance organisms that we're worried about. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Um, so here's our grades from 2012 to 2018 on the lakes that, uh, that I sampled. And you'll notice the ones in red on the 2018 are lakes that went down a letter grade from the year prior. You'll notice 
there was only reds and no greens, and that uh, there's quite a few of them on there, even lakes that um, traditionally didn't have that letter grade. So we had a couple lakes that hit worse than usual, Wakefield at the bottom here being uh, the lowest grade we've seen out there, um, Beaver as well, Bald Eagle has had kind of a uh, up and down, and I'll get into that a little bit. And um, you know, generally it just led us to think something was happening here. We had a pretty bad water quality here as far as we're concerned. We're doing as much as we can on the ground to prevent runoff and things like that, and uh, to have the best management practices to prevent things like this from happening. But yet, here we still see um, a, a decreasing water quality concentration over over the year on an average. So this is a average of the um, Secchi disc reading, or the transparency of the water, the chlorophyll A reading, and the total phosphorus reading. Um, these are based on the Met Council's grading systems, and this is just a, a average of those three. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the good and some of the bad, and why we saw this poor water quality year. Um, first, there wasn't uh, anything that we knew from any of these lakes that would expect us to see decreased trends. We didn't have a bad blowout on a uh, construction project that impaired a lake, and we didn't have anything you know, man-made that we thought was um, a cause of any of these things. But what we did have was some pretty wild weather last spring. I don't know if you guys remember the snowstorm from April, but it was a record breaker. It was this one of the top 20 snowstorms ever, regardless of time of year. And to get one that late in the year is bad for runoff. If you get a huge slug of precipitation that time of year, it's gonna melt very quickly and you're gonna get the consequential runoff. So what we had was very low temperatures, um, quite a bit below average, and very high precipitation for that month. Um, all record setting and all not the usual. Um, in very Minnesota fashion, we had uh, the hottest May right after that. Um, hottest in American history anyways. Not a record here in the, in the Twin Cities area, but it was 8.7 degrees above average. Um, talk about busy slides, I just packed it all into this one. Um, if you look on the lower uh, left-hand corner here, we've got the temperatures throughout the month. And if you look here at the end of the month, we had six days to get above 90, and the earliest 100 degree day in Twin Cities history. So basically, we're just wildly warm really early in the year after a bunch of runoff. So these are all bad things for water quality. And the water temperature, or the temperature in the water responded, as you would assume. We had, um, these are the average temperatures in the upper mixed zone of all of our lakes average. So we're uh, well above what we normally see as far as the average temperature for the whole summer. And pretty, well, also high for our chlorophyll A concentration. So we had more algae on average in all of our lakes combined than we had in most years prior. Um, but if you really look into May and you really look into our shallow lakes, Wakefield's a very shallow lake in Maplewood that um, had one of the biggest decreases in water quality over the year. Uh, in late May, so this is the last sampling that we do in that month, our water temperature was actually 80 degrees. And if you look in previous years, we were below 60 some years. So way above average and the chlorophyll concentration corresponded to that. Um, these might be hard to pick up, but this is the last five years of single point chlorophyll samples. And this is the, when our water hit, this is that 80 degree May and the corresponding next sample being uh, well above that. So the algae in the lake went, went pretty wild and um, there's a lot of anecdotal things you can, I could say to try and explain that, but basically those are the main two hitters. We had a lot of runoff in the spring and then the water got to midsummer high temps uh, very early in the year. Um, some of our good stories, or some of our good lakes that we had good positive con um, water quality numbers in this last year, uh, we're doing part two of things that we're doing on the land. This is a, a project that um, Matt Goshen, who's here, could maybe tell you a little bit more about, but um, this is a, the largest island treatment in Minnesota history, happened in 2014 and 2016 on Bald Eagle Lake, and this is to find that phosphorus um, and to lock it into the bottom portion of the lake. And so the little boat goes around, spreads this flocculent, it binds that up, and it's not available for organisms to utilize for photosynthesis. And so what you saw was, this happened in 2014 and 2016, you see this massive drop off in the algae chlorophyll A pigment where um, about half of what it was before. Uh, total phosphorus numbers doing the same thing and the transparency going uh, up quite a bit as well. So that really has bolstered this lake's water quality and that's why you see that as being an improved grade. It did dip a little bit this last year, which is why it went down a letter grade from the year before, 
but that's partially due to the fact that we've had such a uh, large downward response in the previous years. And you could relate that to that temperature and runoff, or you could relate that to just um, annual variation that you'll see in a lake. But either way, um, seeing great things out there at Bald Eagle and with that project. Uh, another one would be White Bear Lake. And these numbers are kind of staggering. If you look at this transparency in the last uh, couple of years, how it's, it's gone, uh, it's actually up. This is an inverse graph so that uh, it's like you're looking down into a lake on the bottom here. But basically in 2014, we uh, documented a zebra mussel infestation on the lake and they've kind of radically changed the food web there. So they are filter feeding these algae at a really, really fast rate and have gotten ubiquitous in the lake. They're all over the place. And so your total phosphorus numbers aren't changing. You still have as much phosphorus in the lake as you always have. This is historical back to 88 when we first started monitoring out there. Uh, but what you are seeing is drastically less of that photosynthetic pigment and thus a large clearing of the water. So now we're normally we're at about four meters maybe. We're, we're at seven and eight, which were uh, I had to actually buy a different rope for my Seki disc because it didn't go that far down. So that was kind of wild out there and uh, something to keep a lookout for in the future. Um, when you get this low with your uh, photosynthetic pigment, your chlorophyll A, it tends to have a, a kill off effect with the zebra mussels. So we might see this do a uh, up and down type thing in the, in the future where it gets kind of cyclical where they're competing back and forth. But um, one thing we're seeing for sure is it's drastically impacting the water chemistry that we're seeing out there. Um, everybody always asks what we do in the winter. Well, we, we, we still monitor stuff and uh, we have a lot of dissolved oxygen issues where our lakes are eutrophic and shallow and have a lot of plant life and organic matter in them. And in the winter, we, we run out of oxygen and the fish that the DNR stocks in there have the tendency to die off. So we go to great lengths to try and keep those fish alive. Um, part of that is monitoring those lakes there's uh, six lakes that we have aeration systems on, either permanent or temporary, that I'll put out um, when our oxygen levels get low enough to, uh, to warrant it. Um, those are Como, Owasso, Island, Otter, Silver East, and Beaver. There's other lakes in the county that have aerators. Um, I just don't monitor them, or um, I'm not in charge of them personally. So you'll see those on certain lakes, either a floating unit or um, a pump and baffle system on the shoreline that opens up water and uh, helps keep those fish alive. Um, another big part of the winter work is uh, monitoring chloride. Chloride's been an emerging concern here in the county um, and since we are a, a user of large quantities of salt we, we also do a lot of monitoring to to see how we're impacting our lakes. Um, the MPCA put out a report uh, a handful of years ago about impaired bodies in the uh, in the metro um, and Ramsey County was a big part of that effort and a large number of our lakes were categorized as impaired um, or at high risk for being impaired for aquatic life. So basically, if you get enough salt in the water, organisms die off or stop functioning properly. Um, so where does this chloride come from? A lot of it comes from municipalities like Ramsey County and the Department of Transportation and uh, individual homeowners putting it out on their sidewalks or businesses using it as well. Um, but the numbers are fairly staggering about how much we use. These are all just for the Twin City metro area, or the TCMA. 78% um, of what we lay down ends up in either the groundwater or the surface water. That's a fairly alarming stat if you look at how big some of those piles are that uh, most of these places have in the back. But the real uh, numbers are total usage. Um, 700 million pounds a year is uh, the current number that uh, we're working with. Um, basically, too much salt is bad for aquatic life and for drinking water. Um, a lot of the wells in the local area are finding that um, they're contaminated with salt, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, why is it bad? Uh, the NPCA's take home is that one teaspoon of salt puts you above that limit in a five gallon bucket of water. So if you're uh, salting your sidewalk, keep that in mind. Um, every teaspoon uh, pollutes permanently five gallons of water. Um, once it's in the water, you can't really get it out. Salt is extremely soluble and really, really likes to be in solution. In fact, that's why salt rusts things. It wants water so much that it attracts it to it. So if you have salt on your vehicle, it's actually pulling water out of the atmosphere onto your vehicle, and that's why you get rust. Um, if you're a single-celled organism, it causes osmotic stress, where you're used to being able to transport nutrients across your cell wall on a gradient, 
and that's how you control what goes in and out of your cell. If you put a bunch of salt outside of that cell, you throw all those equilibriums off, organisms can't function properly, and uh, it, if it doesn't kill them, it des definitely um, prohibits their ability to live normally. Um, what we have demonstrated is that it decreases biodiversity, so the, the least resilient to the salt will die off when you get above that, uh, that number that I was referencing earlier. Um, it also increases the release of uh, heavy metals. It can, when it gets to the bottom of the sediment, it has the ability to swap with a heavy metal or anything else that's bound up permanently in your sediment layer. Um, and like I said before, 30% of the wells in the Twin City metro area are currently impaired uh, for drinking water limits, which is less than what a water quality limit is, but um, still a pretty high number. Um, so that's fairly alarming since you can't reverse it unless, you know, you use reverse osmosis and most of the drinking water facilities here in the Twin City metro area don't currently have that. So um, not only is it costly to remove it, um, it's, it's challenging and easier to prevent on the inside. Um, here's a list of the lakes that were impaired and what their average concentrations were um, when they were exceeding. So a number of these are Ramsey County lakes, uh, Little Johanna being one of note that we, um, that we see hit high a lot. Um, Como Lake, I'll be talking about here in a little bit, Silver Lake. Um, so these are all really high numbers, uh, eight, 900. Um, anything over 230, again, is what we consider impaired. Um, so these are lakes that were not cur not, weren't impaired at the time of this study, but were at high risk. So that means they were within 90% of, uh, of hitting that number. And these are just historical values that we're seeing where I didn't put a trend line on there, but you can see that these are going up. Um, and uh, the up and down you see are generally related to droughts and uh, heavy rain times. Um, those four starred lakes on the left are uh, ones that are now c considered impaired this last year with um, 2017 was a very high salt use year is harder winter than usual longer winter than usual with that april snowstorm and municipalities used a lot more salt than than usual and uh, we saw pretty high spikes in lakes that didn't necessarily have them um, so this johanna lake is one i'll show you here in a second um, you can see we were trending pretty high and we only had that one go above the limit but then here in 2018 we were above it almost the whole year um, it, it does tend to decrease over the course of the summer as you get more rain, it dilutes it out. But um, those bottom samples at uh, Johanna were, were testing above the limit pretty much all year this last year. This is um, some work we've been, Justin's been working on this, uh, this winter on Como Lake, where during the, this is the, this is the last two years and the, of summers and winter. And you can see during the summer, it, it does just decrease as the summer goes on. But then once winter comes, all that runoff from the 20 plus pipes that go into Como um, really gets that number really high. And uh, this year, we're, that's, that's some kind of record. I don't know if it's the one you want to talk, brag about, but that's definitely the highest reading I've seen on a, a, a lake in, in my time of, of uh, performing that analysis. So it, it's still obviously an issue and uh, something that um, you as citizens should, should be concerned about, I guess. Um, we at the county are certainly concerned about it. I'm talking about it all the time to my coworkers who spread salt for a living, the managers who are in charge of those people. Um, and we've, we've set goals to decrease salt use. This is how much salt we use every time it snows since two, uh, 2000 and generally decreasing trend, uh, a little blip up this last year. Um, that does vary from year to year as you can see, but the, the point is, is that we're, we're working in the right way we're putting resources and money into improving our technology so that we can be better about salt when we do use it. Um, we track our usage on all of our vehicles and uh, calibrate those dispensers on a regular basis so we know who's putting out how much, where, and uh, try and encourage them to use less but still be safe. Um, something I always tell people is to, to shovel or plow more. Uh, physically removing is still the best way to remove salt in, or remove um, ice and snow buildup. Um, the county purchased $145,000 in tungsten carbide plow blades this last year, which is a very large capital improvement that um, these are the new wave high-tech blades that uh, hug the road a little bit better. Um, 
very costly, but uh, really improve the ability to peel up that ice and then allow us to use less salt. So I think we'll see in our 2018-19 uh, numbers, this is going to be back down here and get to a point where ideally that those chloride numbers uh, historically will kind of start to take uh, a dip down over time. Um, the MPCA has been really huge in, in this effort um, and has a number of smart salting trainings and tools and stuff like that. This link's great for all the uh, information they have. If you're a homeowner, or a bit small business owner, or a municipality, this is definitely highly encouraged uh, information here. Um, we also use salt brine, um, a way to decrease the total amount of salt you're using. You're not just throwing big chunks of it down. We're diluting it and spreading it in a liquid form so it hugs the road a little bit better. Um, that's one way we've, we, at the county, decrease that. And whether you're a homeowner or a municipality or anything, uh, sweep up your excess salt and reuse it when you're done. If it's just sitting on a dry sidewalk, it's not doing any good, and that's just going to wash out during the next precipitation. So clean that up, throw it back in the bucket, and you can lay it down next time. Um, these are some other resources if you're interested in more uh, water quality information or um, salt information. And uh, some references from some of the things that I brought up during the talk there. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions that anybody has. Yeah, sure. For sure, yeah. It's a, it's a small piece of the puzzle when you grab it next to plowing and road maintenance and stuff, but it is one that you as citizens can have a big impact on. I would say most people in the metro area do not need a water softener. You should probably have your water softener or your water tested to see the hardness to see if it's worth it. But then also make sure that that's constantly being uh, retrofitted or updated so that it's working properly. You can really go through a lot of salt softening your water, and if you're going through a bag uh, more than once a year, you're probably in need of getting that looked at by a professional to, to get it back to functioning properly, because you shouldn't need that much in this area. We're, we don't have very hard water here in this area. Yeah? Is there, are there any other products out there besides salt for road use, or anything in the pipe that people are working on? For sure. Um, well, they all anything that there is works under the same principle of you're adding a, a solute to, to the water that will change the, the melting point of the ice. Um, they all have negatives, and I, I, unfortunately, we're not currently exploring any of them. Um, in the past, a lot of municipalities have tried a number of different things. Again, they all do the same thing. Um, a lot of them have a eutrophication effect, too, where they're going to, 78 percent of it's going to end up in your, in your water, and if that's the case and it's a, a food source for something, well, then you run the risk of having a, a, an algae bloom or something like that as well. Um, one thing I should note that I didn't bring up earlier is that uh, we didn't have any harmful algal bloom impairments this year that required posting on any of our lakes, which is a, a, a great thing. So even though we had very high uh, algae throughout the year, we didn't have to post anywhere this year, which is, uh, which is always good. We have obviously had to do that in the past, so, so that was uh, a bonus. Yeah? Yeah, I believe they'll have this and I'll have this posted later, so that, that's why I, I put all those links in there. There's quite a few of them in there, actually, so you can uh, do some more research on your own. Awesome. Well, I'll be here if anything else comes up. Thanks. Thank you. There you go. My little public service announcement, and I'm going to add one because of uh, the, the previous slides, but not all aquatic plants or animals are bad. They require care like any landscape. Please take care of them. Um, Coontail is a lot of them. Uh, a lot of them. One that's mentioned a lot, people say, oh, coontail, that's the you know, nasty little uh, aquatic invasive. Not invasive, just highly aggressive. Um, also, when you're managing them, putting dyes in the water is not allowed. That's illicit discharge. Please don't do that. <laughs> so here's some aquatic invasive species that we're dealing with this year. Uh, zebra mussels is one of the top on our radar. So every... Ramsey County Lake is now infested with Eurasian milfoil. Uh, it's a plant 
can get very long, it mats out, huge recreational nuisance. Zebra mussels, we only had white bear for the longest time, oh, uh, for lakes with a boat launch anyways, we only had white bear for the longest time, and then uh, the water supply uh, chains, it's not distracting or anything. Um, but the, uh, uh, this year, unfortunately, we found a single in Bald Eagle, which is this guy right here, and I've got him in the office if you want to see him. Um, and then also, unfortunately, Lake Johanna, which was the five there on the bottom. You can see there's age structure, two distinct classes. That's from Steve McComas at Blue Water Science. Two distinct classes, so they've probably been there a while. Uh, just because we have these now doesn't mean we give up, though. Uh, there's plenty of other ones that can, that can come down the pipe and, and, and mess up our lakes. The problem that we're having with aquatic invasive species, it, it can be that singular zebra mussel colony that gets in there and affects the water quality, but what we're seeing is the rate of change. Um, so you're not only, uh, it, 20 years ago, you would have gotten milfoil, and then maybe 10, 15 years later, you'll get zebra mussels. Now within five years, you've got a lake like Medicine who's getting starry stonewort zebra mussels and Eurasian milfoil and dealing with all these other impairments at one time. So this is rate of change in these systems, they just can't keep up anymore and we don't know what's going to happen. Um, so starry stonewort, sorry, sorry, starry stonewort up there when we talked about algaes, uh, fantastic little invasive algae that can get in. It's only in five lakes right now in Minnesota and I don't want any in Ramsey County to be on that list. That's what it can do to you. Um, so why do we care? Like you said, um, they can change the, the base of the food chain for, uh, for what these the fish are eating. It can have a recreational, uh, it can be detrimental to your recreation on the lake. Um, zebra mussel shells are extremely sharp. If anybody's been up to uh, Mille Lacs or any of these lakes where it, it, it absolutely gets uh, um, all over your beaches, it can cut feet, kids hate them. Um, at scale, they can clog equipment. So right now, St. Paul Regional Water Service is spending a lot of your money treating zebra mussels in the, uh, the pipes and tanks that, that um, transport your drinking water. And then um, they can change the water clarity, which a lot of people, zebra mussels especially, they can change the water clarity. Fantastic, greater water clarity. I got a nice clean lake now, right? Yeah, until the Eurasian milfoil comes in and completely mats you out or causes other issues that, like I say, we haven't even seen yet. Um, Eurasian milfoil, starry stone, or brittle naiad, phragmites, and flowering rush are emergent, so they come along your shoreline. Um, these are very aggressive plants. They don't have anything to stop them. They don't have any diseases. They don't have any, um, anything that will eat them. So they will just keep growing and you'll have to keep fighting them. So they diminish the recreational value of your lake. Disrupt spawning habitat for fish. I put that one in because there's some research out of uh, Michigan that just came out for starry stonewort that it blooms at the same time that bass spawn. So you're getting less bass. If you care about fishing at all, you should be worried. Um, they may have alleliopathic tendencies. They kill other plants. Um, starry stonewort, again, can, can uh, do that. So we're going to do something about this. We're going to take a three-prong approach. We're first going to prevent because I think anybody with a medical background or um, a little bit of uh, economics knows that prevention is a whole lot cheaper than dealing with these things on the back end. Zebra mussels, there's only been one successful eradication that I know of, and that was in a quarry out east, Pennsylvania, New York maybe, where they drained it, bombed it with copper sulfate, and then refilled it. We're not going to do that to any of our lakes. Uh, that's just, that's, that's, that's bad practice for around here. We'll just leave it at that. Um, the second thing, we want to detect our infestations early. Uh, the earlier we can find it, the, the, the better we can treat it. So if we find an isolated population, you may be able to get at it and at least start to manage it and minimize it and, and keep it. Um, I'll go through some of the cool stuff that we're doing with, with new infestations, but we're, we're getting 
so good at this that we're finding them almost too early. So in the case of bald eagle, it was a singular zebra mussel. There's probably more in there, but it was about the size of my pinky. And uh, an early detector, uh, volunteer early detector, found it on a settling plate on the end of his dock. We did 20 plus, almost 30 more hours of diving and, um, and waiting to try to find more, and we didn't find them. So you can't treat what you can't see. And so we're getting so good at it, we don't know what we're, we're uh, going to do when we only find one. And then finally, minimize existing infestations. That's a tough one. Um, not a, eradication's uh, not a really a goal that we can go after just now, and the research of how to do that the best is still very young. So there's a lot of words. If you're interested, talk to me about it afterwards, but this is our plan for 2019 to do all those things. Um, better pictures sh to show what, uh, what we're gonna do. So uh, to prevent, we're gonna inspect and we're gonna gather data while we're gonna do that. So where are these boats going? When do they go? What lakes do they go to at what times? And where are they coming from? Where are they going to? We find all that out by hosting inspections. Our inspectors um, go through DNR training, so they're also educational. They come and they will inspect your boat, but they will also show you how to inspect your boat so that when you go to a lake and there's not an inspector there, you know what you're looking for. Um, we sign, so clean in, clean out, the clean, drain, dispose. You'll see this across the state. Um, that clean, drain, dispose is, is the marketing strategy that the DNR has had so that you know you can just keep that in the back of your head. Make sure your boat and your lifts and any equipment that is coming out of the water is clean, drained, and everything that's on it that's living or could have been living is disposed of. Um, and the, of course, that third point, education, we just need to keep getting at people. We've seen it work, uh, drain plug law, you need to have your drain plug out of your boat before you get on a public um, roadway. We've seen that go from about 5% violation down to 3% violation, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's what we're after, is that last 3% that just doesn't have a tendency to listen. Um, and then we analyze. So in winter, we go back and we look at what happened. Uh, we reach more people and we want to reduce the risk. So we want to understand, um, you might hear uh, some people say, uh, well, it could get on a duck and it could go from, from, from lake to lake. Maybe, but I think the 60 boats that just came from White Bear into Bald Eagle are a lot more of a concern to me than a duck. Um, so I put this up, this uh, formula up there to impress everybody. That's something that uh, US Forest Service has been nice enough to work on uh, for us. The, they have an economist there, uh, Bob Haight, who has come up with a formula that says, if you stick in your data uh, from the boat launch inspections, that says, where did your boat come from and where is it going to? we can stick inspectors at the right place at the right time. So we're getting better at this, but again, this is very young science. This, there's, we're learning as we go with a lot of this. And then of course, we wanna reduce the barriers to clean boats, provide the knowledge, provide the tools. As you can see here, that's something we wanna do this year. We want people to know what to do and we want them to not have to crawl under their boat uh, and just say, ah, forget that, it's only one little fragment, I, it probably won't be a big deal. We want them just to be able to take it right off. And then um, also increase the, the social pressures. There's not going to be inspectors at every launch, at every hour, and even if there is, somebody will find a way around it. What we want to do is make people want to do this. Clean boats are the thing to do. If you're not cleaning your boat on the way out, if you have a zebra mussel on there, then we're gonna publicly ridicule you. And that's what we want it to be, is people taking care of themselves. Um, early detection. Uh, so as John was saying, the villager toes, which are fantastic, but labor intensive, fair to say. Um, having inspectors search, so we have a great volunteer corps with uh, U of M Extension, they have a detectors program. If you're interested in that, talk to me afterwards. Um, 
that's the, the inspectors is how we found, uh, not we per se, but uh, Starry Stonewort at uh, Medicine Lake. A Three Rivers Park District inspector saw something funny coming off a boat, reported it to their supervisor, and within a few hours, they found Starry Stonewort. Um, we also contract a diver each year to go to the boat launches and search a certain amount of hard objects, especially for zebra mussels. Now they're looking for a little bit more starry stonewort, um, but anything else that, that looks odd to them, they're highly trained. Our person, is a, uh, last year was a mollusk person, uh, so they know what they're looking for. Also, uh, very cool, we're lucky enough here to have John who's got a, a background with DNA, so we've been working on getting some uh, eDNA um, protocol going. Um, lots of people working on this, not a whole lot of success so far, so we're just inventing it ourselves. And what, we've, uh, what we're working on now is to try to have it where you would basically take a water sample, everything sheds DNA. So um, try to catch it when there's a lot of the little villagers, their, their reproductive offspring. In the water, there'd be more DNA. You scoop a bottle, you send it to a lab, and they say, yes, we have this marker in DNA that we know is zebra mussel or not. It's just another tool. It's where a lot of these things are going in, uh, in, in conservation in general is towards genetics. So we want to be on the cutting edge of that. And that's actually what John produced last year. And also um, our search methods, the down and dirty, there's, there's, there's nothing scientific about that. You just have to know what you're looking for. Um, response planning. So we want to be quick with this stuff. Um, so what we're trying to do is create a contingency fund, first of all, which we've done. So you, uh, the county now has a contingency fund that if something happens, we have the funds available to treat or do whatever we need to do in order to minimize that infestation. We're also planning. So we've developed a new infestation response plan. So depending on the lake, we know who to contact, what association, what watershed district, what city to get everybody together make a decision fast, because a lot of times with zebra mussels, these things are found in August, after the, after the villagers come out, the young of the year, you find them in August, you've got about a three week window to make a decision. Um, and then collaborating proactively with the cities and other stakeholders. What we also wanna do this year, again, just to be on the cutting edge of, of everything, is for treatment, we, kind of, we wanna understand what level of treatment you would need. So for certain chemicals, there's tons of variables in lakes that can inhibit the efficacy of certain chemicals and, and how well they're used. So we wanna find that out to begin with. You know, Can we take zebra mussels from White Bear Lake and put them into your water and in a mason jar in a lab? and figure out what's that prime dose that's gonna kill 100% of these things and not leave any leftovers, but also not overdose and kill other things and ha have some bycatch. We don't want that. And then also we're lucky enough to have the uh, Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, May Circle here called, who's doing a ton of great work and so we're trying to partner with them on more genetic work, genotyping Eurasian milfoil because there's certain ones that are more susceptible or uh, 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 more resistant to herbicides. So if we can genotype, find out what kind of milfoil you have, we can target it with the right chemical and the right amount. Here's more words, pretty pictures. That's our new infestation response plan. I'm very proud of it. We've got it uh, around the state being torn apart and uh, this was our first draft of it. We just wanted it out there so that somebody could hopefully take it up and make it better. So if you know anybody that has coding or computer background, please talk to me because I want this thing to be useful, but it's being used around the, the, the state right now. Um, so bottom line, the invasions are hard to predict. 
Watch your boats and lifts. If you don't live on a lake, there's tons of other things that you can do. You can volunteer with us as a detector. If you're worried at all about lake health in any way, shape, or form, there's things that you can do right now, and you can be a part of the solution right now. Um, so report those sightings on boats. You can go to the boat launches and you can help us. Uh, there's an ambassadors program if you're really interested in watching boats coming in and out of the water and making sure that they don't have anything. Um, the detectors program, again, I can't say it enough. And report new sightings. If you don't know what it is, bring it to my office. I'm right over there. We want to know what it is. We want to find these things. Um, you'll only get better the more and more you look for these things. Um, so that's the end of my AIS. We'll go back to the announcements later. Any questions at all on aquatic invasive species prevention or issues? Yes, sir. You said the county contracts diver for every boat at every boat ramp? Yes. Is that, is that once a year? Or? Once a year, August, early September. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Again, hopefully to catch those young of the year. Yep, and we'll increase those hopefully on lakes like Johanna and Bald Eagle until we find them. Anything else? In the back there. I'm glad you hear that. Uh, you say that because I've heard several. Um, talk to me afterwards. We'll get in contact. Uh, there was DNR did did a, a biocontrol release. It was what, like ten years ago now, uh, give or take. And I think we're seeing those numbers drop off. And I've I've heard that from several different people. And it's something we could probably address. Go ahead. I have not heard that. Um, I know we've, anecdotally I've heard it's been, there's been a whole lot less resistance. I, in the beginning there were, there were, people didn't quite understand what it was, they thought it was heavy handed. Um, now when you hear out, you, when you go out and inspect, you hear a lot of thank yous. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that are, that are trying to skirt around the system whichever way they can. I've heard, again, anecdotally of certain businesses that will do that. Um, we're trying to address that, but there's a whole lot of other low-hanging fruit that we need to get to first, just being out there. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll wrap up with some announcements. Um, and then if there's anything else, I'll stick around after for, for questions. I'm sure everybody else will. But May 17th will be the next uh, forum. We're thinking composting as a broad uh, category. We'll send out a survey monkey afterwards and get some information uh, from you. AIS detectors, again, if you're interested, they have classes coming up. One's being held here May 3rd. There's a cost to it. Don't let that scare you. Come talk to me. We'll figure it out. Um, any more questions on any of the topics here today? That's all of our contact information. And I've got one more slide, so I will come back to this in just a second. Um, the Survey Monkey. We'll send out a link to anybody that signed up online or gave me their email when they RSVP'd for this. If you did not sign up um, and I don't, or you did it by phone and I don't have your email, this sheet right in front of Brandon here, uh, give me your email. Otherwise, just take that uh, SurveyMonkey link down and write it down. Give us until Wednesday to refine the questions and get everything on there. Sound good? Oh, and if you don't like computers, just give me a call. I'll do it for you. So thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs>